standing by. morning and what a spectacular morning it is welcome to the sunrise safari the night has been dark and cloudy and windy and we're waking up to see what's been happening throughout the bush in the middle of the night welcome to the sunrise safari my name is jamie i have tebs on camera with me this morning brent is out with andrew following up on the tracks of Karula to see if he can relocate her after yesterday's sunset safari. Big welcome to Joe Wood and any other new viewers. We are coming to you live from the Juma and Arethusa game reserves within the Sabi Sands, and that all falls under the greater Kruger National Park within South Africa. An enormous wilderness area that has been under protection and the animals have moved about for the last hundred or so years. And as you can see, it is a stunning morning, absolutely beautiful. Let's just sit and listen for a moment to the joy of the birds waking up. Franklins, scrub robins, drongos, a red chested cuckoo all calling and greeting the new morning. I'm on my way across to the eastern boundary to see if those lions from last night have made an appearance. In the meantime, let's pop over to Brent so that he can say good morning as well. So, welcome to Safari Live, back in the area where Karula was last. Oh, I see eyes on that termite mound. I wonder what it could be. I think it's a little bush baby. I don't think I know it's a little bush baby now. Uh, moving up that little knob thorn. Hopefully it's still there by the time we get there. Uh, by the way, I'm Brent Leo Smith. I've got Andrew and Joseph Francis on camera. And this is a Safari Live. And we're in search of a female leopard. But the magnificent thing, magnificent thing about the bush is while we search for everything, we find others. And here we go. Look at that. Tiny little bush baby or South African Galago on his way home. Oh, disappeared behind the tree. I'm just going to go back a little bit. Might be a hole and it's disappeared into where it's going to spend. Now, do you see anything, Andrew? Let me try forward. Hoping my pop skip and jump, but let's have a look, it could be another, it could be a hole, and it's at its added to roosting side for the night. There isn't a hole, but definitely done, or she's done a disappearing act on us. I'm just going to check up the tree, see if maybe went higher, and they got in, they can jump incredible distances but it's made a disappearing act. But what a wonderful way to start the sunrise safari. So, bush baby families have little territories uh, that they patrol and defend quite extensively against other little bush babies. So they will have multiple nest sites sort of in, an, in, in their territory. And uh, depending on where they end up for the evening while out foraging, uh, they'll go back to that. So one of the fascinating ways about how they mark their territory uh, and it's got a, sort of a, a double-edged benefit to them is that they urinate on their hands. And this is the two reasons for this. The one is that they have nice sticky hands if you are jumping from branch to branch. And it gives a little bit more grip. But also it enables them to spread their scent uh, over a much further distance, not only where they urinate, but everywhere they climb, um, their scent will be. So really, really fascinating little creatures. And, uh, Quite ferocious little predators if you're a moth or other nocturnal flying insect. So they're 
they do feed quite extensively that also on fruits and also on gum specifically acacia gum and also ebony gum and what they'll do is they'll actually almost farm the gum so they'll chew on certain trees at the exact spot uh, forcing the tree to exude gum i will have a look uh, and see if i can find you some gum later on on the sunrise safari Hopefully, the Queen of Juma, Karula, is uh, still in the area. It was a very small kill. She might have finished it overnight. And then we're going to have to start tracking all over again. But that's half the fun, isn't it? cloudy morning to Rich Levy in Highland Park and Rich wondering uh, guys who work in a sort of traditional safari lodges what is their average sort of work leave cycle how long do they work before they go and leave um, they work on a very similar cycle to what we do Rich um, it's generally six weeks on and uh, two weeks off so you'll be on for seven days a week um, for the six weeks in, in some form or another but then two weeks off every six weeks and of course this is quite wonderful uh, for us if you think about it and uh, we get nice big chunks of holiday and the problem is when you go visit people everyone else has the nine to five so while you are loafing uh, during your two-week break on a sort of Monday at 10 o'clock there's not many of your friends who can join you for a cup of coffee. Okay, we're right in this area where Karula was last seen. Maybe we'll also find Scott's comedian. Who knows? a beautiful morning i agree and she says what happened with krula and her, her daika on last night's sunset safari and uh, we're right in the spot and i know just before scott left she did start feeding on it and uh, it was right there in this at the base of this little thicket and it looks to be gone so there's one of two options uh, to what Karula's done. She, if she was quite full, she might have stashed it in a tree around, which we'll go have a look at now. Um, the other option is uh, she might have just scoffed it all down uh, and finished it. We should have a quick look. This is the, the tree that Scott and Vim had that, that chameleon in on the sunset fire. I'm just making sure we can't find it, see if it's just moved along. And I keep forgetting. Uh, quite often, millions are on the peripheries of bushes like this in the early morning and during the night. But they are mobile. So it looks like it has moved on. So a couple of safaris ago, Raisa asked me if I'd seen three horned chameleons and I promised to show uh, a picture of the largest chameleon species <coughs> oh, excuse me, in the world and that occurs in the Nyombo woodlands of northern Mozambique, southern Tanzania, uh, northern Zambia. So I went into my archives onto my computer and managed to pull that picture off to show you guys and it is an incredible thing. I said, it's about the size of a Jack Russell. 
So I've only seen them three times in southern Tanzania. There we go. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? That is the largest chameleon species on the earth. Believe it or not, they actually eat birds. Big congratulations to Cat in Tampa, Florida. They've never seen a bush baby before, before. So very excited, ticking it off her hair. What are you doing? And Andrew is basically uh, complaining that I'm driving uh, while I'm reversing. I'm putting him in a push, and I just have one thing to say, Andrew, be thankful it wasn't a thorn tree. The next one might be if you continue this behaviour on drive. So, well, well done to Cat for getting her first bush baby and adding it to her safari live mammal list. So we're just going to check if there's a marula to see if it's, she hasn't popped it in one of these marula trees. All of them look quite nice for hoisting. To answer Jared, he's wondering is that the South African lesser bush baby? Uh, yes, that is the old name for that, that bush baby species. Um, it was a lesser bush baby. It is now named a South African Gallego. So no diker in the tree. I'm almost hoping as I look a little bit further afield to sort of see that very distinct feline outline in the sky, but I think she's scoffed it all. We're just gonna check this last marula tree. If nothing there, uh, we're gonna hop on board with Jamie and she can give you an update down on the eastern boundary. So nothing in the tree. Let's go see what Jamie's up to. Just made it across onto Cheetah Cut Line. And I'm checking really carefully to see if the lions have decided to make their way back onto Juma. Now I hear that you were with a bush baby with Brent, and I have to just tell you the story that we had before we went live. Tibbs and I were out driving in the dark, and we stopped to look at a bush baby, and it launched itself across over the bonnet, but it misjudged, and it very nearly landed on the car. And we seem to be developing a bit of a theme at the moment, with animals appearing to want to join us on our safaris, which I'm sure you can all understand. And we did have a viewer who's fairly new to our safaris as far as far as I know and I have a question to ask you you wanted to know if the safari guides like your name well actually we were just tossing up is it safari like safari but you're a South African is that is that what we're going with uh, just let us know I do like your name by the way if that's where it's going I enjoy that a safa for those of you are unfamiliar is a South African. It's the term for a South African. I'm not sure if it's something that South Africans came up with and has just been adopted or if it came from somewhere else. I mean, there's South Africans spread out throughout the globe. So safari or safari, let us know if we're getting your name right or which way you want us to pronounce it. Might make answering any questions or comments that you might have a little bit easier. And don't forget, for new viewers watching either on the or on any of the various platforms, you can send us through questions and comments, anything that you'd like to chat about or ask about. We're really keen to hear from you, so please do. There's nothing better than being able to interact with you on a more personal level. A quick summary of our evening last night. We had the three Inkahumas that killed a buffalo on the Sunrise Safari. It was a small, smallish buffalo, sub-adult year old size. They were finished fairly quickly because there was one Birmingham boy who happened to be in attendance. And he, I think, scoffed most of that. We stayed with them at Bucklesford Dam for the entire afternoon. Right at the end, they started to hunt waterbuck. Now, I'm not sure what went wrong in that hunt. I couldn't switch on my engine and I couldn't shine my lights. So I couldn't really see, but something, they obviously missed the hunt. 
and the water buck got away and moved off. They wandered across towards water. And I think that they went to Bucklesop Dam because they thought there was going to be water there. And it's been so long since the Inkahumas wandered around that particular area that they obviously hadn't realized how much the dam had dried up. We also had the most amazing sighting of an elephant bull trying to go into Bufflesook Dam itself to get at the plants that were growing around. Ah, oh, the plants, I spoke this morning to Brent about it, and the name's just gone straight out of my head, the plants that are growing on the mud at Bufflesook. They are apparently quite toxic, in, at least to certain animals, but apparently the elephants absolutely love them. South African living in Saudi Arabia and you said that yep we are migratory but we always return home. There's a saying that I was first taught when I came to work in the bush and that if your, free, if your feet touch red soil you either come back to visit regularly or you just never leave. You can understand why. And while I double check around the tracks. Brent has found one of the water bucks that I was chatting about a little bit earlier, so let's pop over and have a look. So, we're with some water buck that their bre whose brethren nearly became the evening meal for the Nkahuma Pride last night. And you can see wonderfully fluffy in the neck. And you have very very elegant look about them. And you know, there's some young males here as well, sitting and watching us. And you can see that very distinct, even from this distance, white ring around the bottom, a following mechanism for the follow each other through thick bush. I've probably been ruminating for the majority of the night. Now up and at him, so to speak, in the early morning, I start moving off to feed. The emblem of the Sabi Sands Game Reserve is a big male water buck with wonderful wide sweeping horns. So Judy was saying, Brent, why do you call Andrew Andrew Joseph Francis when we know his middle name is Anand? Well, I'm going to let Andrew answer that. Uh, Andrew, why, why do I call you Andrew Joseph Francis? That's my birth middle name, so... Here we go. So Anand is a nickname? Yes. Uh, and his proper middle name is Joseph. I think maybe we should start just calling him Joseph for a while, see how he takes to that. That's fine by me. Here we go. So we're going to leave these water back. So what we're doing at the moment is we are circling uh, the area where Karula is last seen. And we're going to check all the roads around um, to see if we find any of those pretty little petite cat tracks uh, coming out of the area. Lovely pink hue starting to form on the horizon up here. Oh, hello. zebras and a lot of our long-time viewers will have noticed very much an increase in zebra sightings now the reason for this is twofold uh, one is because of the very dry conditions uh, that we're experiencing at the moment so the water in this area is drawing the zebras in from far afield and the reason they are coming from far afield is uh, that in the last sort of year, year and a half, uh, the Kruger National Park has changed its uh, one of its policies. And very interesting, and in I am all for it. And the reason is that they've closed all the man, the majority of the man-made waterholes uh, around the park, keeping very few of them open. 
60s and 70s when those waterholes were created, uh, the implications, the long-term implications of that uh, were not really understood. So what happened is all these waterholes were put into parts of the park where there was never permanent water. Uh, and what this caused was a sort of migration of dam and, and also a complete change in habits. Uh, and in doing so, they inadvertently almost completely wiped out certain species in the park. And the, majority, the main ones being roan sable uh, and, and brown hyena. So traditionally or historically what happened is there would be pans and, and stuff around. And during the rainy season, animals like wildebeest, zebra, buffalo, uh, to a lesser extent spotted in the hyena and lions, following those animals would move into these areas where there were only pans and uh, for the, the wet season they would all focus around there. As soon as the dry season came, uh, those animals that are very dependent on water, so zebra, wildebeest, buffalo in particular, uh, would then move back down to the permanent water seeps and rivers. And uh, for an animal like sable and roan that are very, very specialist feeders, very, very important so they wouldn't have to compete during the dry season with those bulk grazers. Uh, but now with the water being permanent those animals never left. So it basically they got out competed and the same with the brown hyena. Uh, the brown hyena can never compete with the spotted hyena and the spotted hyena is very far more dependent on water than brown hyena. So now that there was permanent water in these areas, the spotted hyena stayed and basically uh, caused a local extinction of the brown hyena. So after sort of 50, 60 years, the Kruger has, and it, this is incredible, that they are actually big enough to admit when they're wrong and they've now closed these water holes. Another really important uh, aspect of this is that when you have the animals traveling quite often big distances between water and seasonally using different environments. It's very good for something that we like to refer to as hoof action. Uh, and that's why I, I, I'm quite, I know a lot of people will probably be quite upset with me, but I'm quite excited for this drought. So we've had a very wet cycle and uh, a lot of this thick, thickness of the bush, it shouldn't be this thick. If we look at a lot of these trees, they're sort of 10 to 12 years old, so all grown during this wet cycle. So traditionally, if we look historically sort of back beyond the 60s from old aerial photographs, this whole area was far more open and far more grassland. Uh, and I'm going to definitely take you to an area where it's, it's, it's very visible, uh, what the elephants are doing at the moment. So there's no grass for the elephants to eat, which they normally eat at this time of the year. And they're now absolutely annihilating these younger bush willows and, and, and terminalias. And what that is, is it's actually going to open up the bush more uh, and it creates more space for grass. A lot of grass doesn't like to grow under trees and quite often you're, you're really good grazing grasses. So even though we might have a drop off in, in, in herbivore numbers now during the drought, while the weak ones are unable to, uh, to, to survive and they're picked off by the predators, uh, when the next sort of good wet season comes, uh, the grass will make a comeback. And also with the amount of sort of hoof action I was talking about, animals moving to and from and digging up the soil. Uh, you can imagine if you're a gardener and you take a garden fork and you till the soil to turn over that, that, that nice rich topsoil and plant seed. So that's naturally happening. And especially if those big herds of buffalo are very important for that, and especially during a dry period, they're often moving very big distances. So they turn up the soil and they also fertilize as they go. So very, very interesting and, and, and it's going to create a much more open environment uh, which is better for the wildebeest, zebra and buffalo. So it's very interesting how nature works and you have this sort of wet cycle when the trees dominate for a while and now we're going through to a dry cycle uh, and, and hopefully the grass species will come back uh, and that will also be beneficial to the herbivores as I was saying and after the drought is over and the rain comes the numbers should start increasing. So everything works in the balance uh, and uh, to quote my dad, quite often us as human beings consider ourselves uh, uh, above the natural system and we start playing and getting 
involved in interfering. And uh, it's a very apt description that my dad uses. He says, we're gardeners in Eden. We take something that works and it's perfect and we try to change it. And, and, and normally when we do that, we end up making huge mistakes, as, as quite apparent with the, what happened with the Kruger. So just in case you remember, we, we're gardeners in Eden. So we arrive in Eden, which is this perfect utopia uh, that works and, and, and nature functions in balance and then we go start adding water holes and we start doing this and that's uh, we end up changing the, the, the complete nature of, of the environment we live in. Oh look at that Andrew and there we go isn't that spectacular here comes the rising sun popping over the eastern horizon so Another two or three ridges from there is actually boundary of the Kruger National Park. Well, a very good morning and uh, hopefully you've got your long stockings on in your fireplace roaring Anna Marie. Anna Marie says, isn't it incredible and amazing? She can't believe that sometimes she's sitting at home in a major blizzard and watching a stunning African sunrise here with us on Safari Live. Always good while we enjoy the sunrise, just listen for a few seconds, see if we hear any notable sounds. And what we're listening for is obviously possibly the call of uh, a big cat. Oh, Andrew spotted a hole, disused artfark hole. And it's not a, a, a home hole that looks like a hole that has been excavated uh, to try and get at some termites. So the dawn chorus is starting. You can hear a lot of sort of <laughs> off to the left of us. And uh, those are long-tailed shrikes or magpie shrikes waking up. And I can hear some hardy dars flying over. Not the most beautiful call in the African bush. So, <laughs> John in England says, we know Vim is the wildebeest, but uh, possibly Andrew should earn his nickname, which is the Artfark, and find us an Artfark. I agree with you 100%, John. Andrew, find us an Artfark. Uh, and uh, there is a possibility uh, at this time of the morning uh, that they might still be up. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the active den site I didn't know about is no longer active and they do change den sites and i am very much hoping to be the first presenter uh, to be able to show everyone an art fark on the live drives so fingers crossed and i'm definitely going to have to keep looking for active art fark dens so we're gonna carry on we're checking for those of you who might have got up a little bit late or joined us a little bit late, Karula was in this area behind me and we're checking around it to see where she's come out and where she might possibly have been. Fortunately, lots of elephant around, so the tracks might be quite difficult to spot, but that's half the fun. We're on the, on the hunt for Karula. Uh, while we continue, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Speaking of animals wandering across tracks, I wanted to show you the tracks of where the Nkuhumas crossed last night. Unfortunately, a group of Dugger boys or buffalo males walked straight across them and pretty much obliterated them. But I really want to focus on showing you guys some of the tracks from last night. I'm just waiting for the sun to get up a little bit, I'm trying to time it so that the light is perfect for having a look. And for those of you who were watching last night as the Inkahoomas walked up the road, it would be a really nice opportunity for you all to get an idea of what it looks like when, or what uh, the tracks look uh, like exactly morning. at that, the speed that they were walking at. This is where the buffalo kill was around this particular block. seems to be quiet though this morning. I know that big herd of buffalo walked through yesterday. Now 
doesn't look as though they've made their way back here. No sign of the Inkarumas crossing back onto Juba. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to. It's still nice and cool. It's actually quite chilly this morning. Apparently, we started off the morning at about 20 degrees or 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Which maybe for those of you in colder climates, you must be thinking it's absolutely ridiculous that we call that cold. But I think we lose a little bit of perspective here as to what cold actually is. And this morning feels a bit chilly. though for the cats it's mean it means that they're going to be wandering around hello vulture <laughs> he's on his way it was that hooded vulture from yesterday afternoon yesterday afternoon andrew and i were tracking the lionesses and we came around the corner and a vulture got startled and shot out of the tree on our on the right of us and as a result, both of us were so busy looking at it, we completely missed the lions that were underneath the tree for a good, good five or so seconds before we realized they were there. I think we were just out of practice in terms of lion spotting. But the vultures hanging around, there's not much left of the buffalo. And having a look now at the road, the hyenas have cruised through at some point last night as well. The little hooded. they can pick at the little bones and pieces that are left. As we're driving along Biffles Hook East, Christopher, you were wondering whether or not all of the roads on Juma and Arethusa have names and if there are any maps available. Well, Christopher, a big warm welcome. Christopher's watching all the way in Arizona. Yes, all of the roads have names because it makes it so much easier for guides to call in sightings, describe where something is. You can imagine if within our, ne our road network we had to say that one road that runs east of Buffalo Hook Dam. Okay, maybe that was a bad example because the road is called Buffalo Hook East, but you get by drift. And what you'll find is actually really fascinating is the stories behind why roads are called what they're called. It's one of my favorite things to do at every reserve that I've worked at is to try and get a bit of the story behind why they have that name. And the one, there's some beautiful road names. There's one that's on the reserve I used to work at called Hlalagahle which means go well. It's a traditional, it's a South African farewell. And you say it to somebody who's leaving to go away from you. If, they, if a person is staying and you want to say goodbye, you say salakafle, which means stay well. And this particular road, sorry, I'm just checking this dam to see if anybody's come down. But the story behind that was actually there was a memorial to some of the reserve owners that had died in a plane crash. But beautiful stories behind road names. All kinds of stories. Oh, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to wander down into Buffles Hook Dam. Let's do, I wonder if Rusty's signal will be up for it. I wanted to go explore the mud where the elephant walked last night. Let's go do that while we wait for the sun to come up and I can show you those lion tracks. Let's see if we can manage. watching from Canada. I'm glad that you're sticking with us and watching the sunrise. And you were wondering if all of the animals have names. Sorry, just got to negotiate a bumpy patch. And Joe, uh, generally our leopards and our lions absolutely do. That's pretty much a reserved tradition within South Africa. 
So our leopards and our lions are named. Recently we've been trying to put, give names to the hyenas to try and keep track of them. But beyond that, we don't tend to name any of the other animals. Sometimes there might be a particular character that is really interesting. So for example, a, an, an elephant or a hippo that's made itself at home around us that we see regularly, and then we might name them. But for the most part, it's largely the leopards and the lions that get names. This is where the elephant bull was walking yesterday. Here you can see there is actually a bit of water. And if we look, Tibbs, if we can zoom in on the mud around that water, I see tracks in there. And those look like lion tracks. So maybe the Nkumas were more sensible than we realized. Difficult to see. I'm gonna hop out and have a closer look. Let's have a look and see. Looks like lion tracks to me. Oh, oh my word. This could end badly. I could end up in the mud. Yep. These lions definitely came down to drink yesterday. It must have happened sometime before we saw them. But you can see how they've splayed into the mud and their toes have spread out as they've led down to have a drink. This is the only real spot where they could actually come down and have water. And I don't know how clearly you can see it, but there's one two, three, four toes, and the back pad sliding in ever so slightly into the mud. Well, that's awesome to see. So they were sensible, they did have a drink. Now yesterday, when we were here watching the Nkuhumas, I was telling you about that big elephant bull that walked into the mud. Now I can't position the car to go and see exactly how deep it is where he was walking, but I'm gonna take a little walk, a little stroll, and you can have a look to see exactly how deep it actually is. See if I can show you without disappearing into the mud myself. Now apparently, Brent was able to walk across this mud. Let's see if it works for me. watching yesterday I said that I wanted to come back and just see that hole that I was in there came up to about mid thigh but he was actually much much deeper there's another one further in that probably would end up about to my waist height so I'm about five foot seven so that puts it at about three feet down maybe about four feet down into the mud <laughs> it was extraordinary to witness I didn't go into the deepest hole because I was a little bit concerned I may never come out again. Cool. Nice to just have a look at those sorts of things. It was fascinating to see. I was so surprised by his commitment to the cause.
So just to finish up with that particular elephant sighting, that bull that we were looking at had fairly average, wow, that sun is incredible, that sky. Sorry, distraction. Short attention span. But that really is truly beautiful. I know that you were looking at it with Brent, but it's the first time I've had a proper look. Wow. Beautiful. All right, right, back to the elephant. Concentrate, Jamie. Stop getting distracted by the pretty sky. Back to the question about that elephant. Oh, thank you for the reminder. Nikki's just really kindly reminded me to avoid the landmines that the lions dropped on this road. Thank you, Nikki. We'll be very careful where we drive. I'm talking about lion scat, and you really, 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 really don't want to drive through it. It's The smell will stick on your wheels for ages afterwards, unless you do something drastic, like drive through sand or something to clear it. And it actually, in the animals that you stop to watch afterwards have a tendency to then sprint away from you because you carry the lion scent. And not only that, it's actually quite miserable for the people concerned on the back. Yesterday, Andrew and myself were struggling a little bit with the smell, which was making my eyes burn. But yes, the elephant bull that wandered into the dam yesterday it was a fairly average sized elephant bull. Not the most, not the biggest tusks I've ever seen. But Monkey Man, you were wondering how big can an elephant's tusks actually get to? Now there's an incredible museum in the Kruger National Park, which is an area open to us, that actually that has some of the, the biggest tuskers ever recorded within the Kruger National Park. And those tusks are taller than me, taller than Brent even. Brent's about two meters, so about six foot roughly. A little bit shorter, just a fraction. Okay, quite a big fraction. But yes, those tusks can get to absolutely enormous lengths. I'm talking over two meters. And in terms of weight, some of the heaviest that were recorded there, one of them went right up to 80 kilograms, one tusk. 80 kilograms, that's about 160 pounds. Imagine walking around with that weight on the edge of your face, on the end of your face. You can imagine the lever, the length of them. Astronomical to think about. Now, let me find you a nice set of lion tracks because Safari, you want to know what the average size of the lion paw is. Oh, and I've just realized why I'm smelling Buffles Hook Dam. I've taken some of it back with me on my knee. Oh dear. <laughs> hmm. That is unintentional. It's quite smelly, bud. And now I have a smelly knee. Oh well. I suppose it's better than lion scat. Wonderful stuff. So, Caitlin, who is 11, oh, sorry, let me just try and get a nice position on these lion tracks because I really want to answer this question properly. Tebs, do you think if we have a look at those, we'll be able to see them in this light? So, both Safari, who is watching our show, and Caitlin and Kayla, who are 11 and 10 respectively. Apparently, those two little, oh, those two little ladies watch our show regularly. They watch our Sunset Safari as part of their homeschool education, and they watch our Sunrise Safari at night, but sometimes get tired. 
So yesterday, we were looking at the bottom of the lion's pad, and I said that big cats have three lobes at the back, and dogs and hyenas have two. Uh, Caitlin and Kayla have gone checking up because they wanted to have a look at their dog and their cat's feet, and they noticed that at the back of their dog's pad, their dog had three, has also got three lobes. So you were wondering whether or not it's a general division, or if all canines have only two pads at the back. Let me hop out, I want to show you what I mean. We still need the sun to come up a bit, actually, to see this trap clearly, but it helps with the average size as well. So first, let's deal with the size. This is the trap that we're looking at here. Oh, I'm going to give you a bit of perspective. This is the size of my hand, and it's about the size of this lioness's front track. So the front feet of all animals are always, with some exceptions, which I'll get to in a moment, but almost all animals, they carry most of their body weight on the front. So the majority of their body weight sits around their shoulders and their head, means that their front tracks are nice and big and round, whereas their back tracks are slightly smaller and more narrow. If I grab a stick, I can actually trace for you what I mean about the back pads. That's not the clearest light, but at the back, the track goes one, two, three, and then there's one, two, three, four toes. This is the front track here, shaped in a nice circle, and the back track, which is a bit more pointy. So for Caitlin and for Kayla, with your question about whether all dogs and hyenas have three lobes or two lobes, they still have the sort of the third lobe, but it's, it's a bit smaller in dogs, which means it doesn't show up clearly when they leave footprints. So for your research, have a look where your dog walks. Maybe if your dog walks in mud or on some sand, have a look and see if you can see that third lobe. Usually you can't. And I've looked on my dog's track as well, and I can see that I can only see the two lobes, even though there are three at the back. Whereas with cats, those three lobes show up nice and clearly. And it's especially clear with the big cats because their feet are nice and big. This is from last night with the lionesses walking down the road. I'm still going to try and find you a clearer one. Come on, son. You need to come up so we can see the tracks properly. But Caitlin and Kayla, I am very proud of you guys for going and doing that research. I think that's a very good idea. And for all kids watching, the tracks that you learn about here, you can do the same thing at home. Have a look at the animal tracks, have a look at the horse tracks, deer tracks, anything like that. You can learn all about tracking in your hometown. Declan is 11 years old. Declan, you were wondering if there will be diseases in the mud on my leg. Declan, I hope not. Um, I, no, I'll be absolutely fine. The smell is coming from some algae and some decomposing plant material, but nothing serious. Even though there have been a couple of rotting, rotting fish in Buffelsook Dam, those have mostly decomposed now. I'm not too worried, Declan, about it. I'm sure I will be absolutely fine. Luckily, though, it's on my knee and not in my mouth or in an open cut. Generally quite a good idea to keep those quite clean. Well, while I continue on my search for nice tracks to show you and interesting things to teach you, let's pop over to Brent for an update. So we did manage to find Karula's tracks, but we've left them. Uh, or we just came over the radio saying there was a male leopard calling in this area. So we've come to give him a hand here. And if we don't have any luck with this male leopard, we'll go back onto Karula's last tracks. Her tracks were actually heading in this direction. The last track was about a kilometer and a half uh, to the west of us. And uh, we have a new viewer called The Awesome One on uh, YouTube. It says, that looks like a cool job. It is a very cool job, and we're very lucky to have a job that we love. Uh, and The Awesome One, uh, don't forget, you can also ask us questions about our awesome job. And you can do that by popping us an email at questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safarilive on Twitter. So 
So we've left the female leopard tracks. We're on search of a big male leopard track. Uh, if I had to hazard a guess, it's more than likely going to be a Tingana. But who knows? Could it be a new male? You never know. That's the best thing about the bush. It is something completely strange and different could happen around every corner. some tracks and uh, Roy, Roy and Patrick are wondering can you tell the difference between male and female lion tracks uh, you can you can actually also extend that into leopard uh, it's generally from the size uh, put it this way a big male lion track is like a small side plate the size of my hand there's a female probably uh, not half the size but definitely substantially yeah probably about the same size as Jamie's hand uh, so and, and the same can be said with uh, female and male leopard tracks. A really big male leopard will almost be the same size as my, the palm of my hand in the female. And it depends. Certain animals have bigger uh, tracks than others. And we know so Karula, one of the female leopards we see regularly, has very small tracks. So guys, Jamie is just trying to get hold of me on the radio, so let's see what she wants. Go ahead. checking around Weaver's Nest. He said the audio sounded somewhere sort of between Philemon's and Treehouse. I'm checking Shabam through to uh, Gary Mann, and I'm going to do Treehouse back down to Weaver's Nest. Uh, if we get no luck here, there, is, there are tracks of Karula uh, that head sort of southeast uh, from Balanites Junction with uh, Zoe's and Rebecca's. me doing there is uh, chatting to Jamie who's out in a different part of the reserve. Also sometimes I'll be chatting to Aubrey or Taxon or the other guides. And finding animals is a team game. So obviously if there's more of you looking for an animal it's easier to find. So Aubrey and I are both looking for this male leopard who was calling. And uh, for those of you who might not know what a male leopard sounds like when it calls, uh, it, it's the best description I can give you like sawing wood and uh, I suppose one step there within the description is a, an impersonation so here goes my best uh, male leopard core it's uh, often called coughing or sawing as well but <clears throat> it's quite harsh on the throat <laughs> there we go my best male leopard uh, impersonation uh, hopefully it doesn't uh, get the male leopard we're looking for uh, to cause any jealousy. I, mean, I might have a better rasp than he does. Andrew thought that was quite funny, by the way. He's, uh, he's giggling behind me. G-A, and uh, it's because it's a short build based lander, it's hard to write its name, uh, and it can chiga chiga, which means it can twist and turn through the bush, that's how chiga got its name, chiga chiga, and, uh, and Noreen, Noreen, sorry, is wondering uh, why am I driving this vehicle today and Jamie is driving Rusty and which determines which presenter drives which vehicle on which day and are there any particular favorites? Well, uh, with the vehicles, we 
we rotate through them. So we'll, we'll do two drives on each vehicle before swapping. So it's, it's very fair. We, we share the vehicles evenly. Uh, and uh, Wendy, uh, Wendy got her name uh, because it came as a name. Apparently it was called Wendy beforehand and uh, before we bought it. Wendy is uh, at the doctor. So she is in the town of Hoodsprat. Uh, having some work done on her and she's also getting currently getting her, uh, her big six month service so uh, obviously these vehicles have quite a hard time and uh, and they need to be maintained in that and after six months we often have to do things like bushes and bearings and, and things like that and then uh, the last the third vehicle the, the latest in our fleet um, is rusty uh, and uh, that's because it had a bit of rust on the chassis when we first got it. And speaking of rusty, uh, 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 Jamie's driving rusty this morning. And uh, a rusty was, a rich, as it was actually brought in as a backup vehicle to Wendy and Jigger. Uh, and also, uh, Andrew's quite fond of rusty because it's uh, when it's, the drone is up and operational. That is Andrew's, Andrew's drone as drone commander. Uh, he sits on the back of Rusty and likes to think he's very important while he zooms around in the air. So, speaking of Rusty, Rusty uh, has a wild animal with a heartbeat. So let's go have a look at what Rusty's got. Our wild animals are playing particularly camera shy. But we've got a lovely herd of Inyala that we see quite regularly on this road. One of them has been highly entertaining in the past, dashing around and just generally playing. That's a female that you're looking at there, that light tan color. There's a little male in the front as well, but they're not playing nice this morning. They're obviously feeling a little bit camera shy. Maybe they woke up with a bad hair day. Hey, Pinales, can you stop? Stop, don't disappear. Ah, the joys. Live wildlife filming. last view of those in Yala, unfortunately, that I think we're going to get. They've decided to move off into the thickest vegetation they could possibly find. Now, a couple of days ago, that was with Tebs, actually. Tebs and myself were driving, having just had the most spectacular black mamba sighting. And we came upon quite a mysterious scene, which was a dead in Yala with a battalier feeding off her. And we went off and we double-checked and we tried to see what, well, I actually thought it was a kill at first. I was trying to see if we could find the predator attached to it. There was no sign of any predation on it. But Safari Dean, you were wondering if maybe it was possible that a leopard or karuna in particular had broken that Nyala's neck or killed it and then been scared away by elephants before they had a, she had a chance to devour it. That's an entirely possible option. Now, I couldn't see any signs of bites around the neck, but the carcass was quite decomposed and there were some scars and some old patches that could maybe have been puncture wounds or signs of a struggle. It's very difficult to tell. That's as likely a theory as any one of the ones that we came up with. It was oh. Hello, boy. Hobby, hobby. We've actually got a nice Nyala who's going to quite possibly walk behind that bush but having seen that female for new viewers it's always nice to have a look at the difference between the males and the females you can see that much much darker coat with the tan stockings only the male in yalas have horns as well this is a nice impressive big male they're also much fluffier than the females and the reason behind that is it adds to their intimidation factor so when a male in Yala fights, or is going to fight, they do what's known as pylo erection, where they fluff up all of the fur along their back and their tail, 
and make themselves look nice and big to look more intimidating for other males. Let's go forward a little bit. Maybe he's going to come out and still play nice. Oh. It's very, very common to see these in Yala, and they tend to habituate to people really nicely. And you often see them in camp gardens and where the water, where the lawns are watered, so the food is nice. And oh, and Tube, you were wondering, welcome, by the way, to our safari family. And please keep sending through your questions. You were wondering if it's ever likely that the Inyala would attack. And the answer is no. They are far more scared of us than we should ever be of them. That being said, perhaps it would be a good idea for that question to also be sent through to Brent, who has had quite an interesting Nyala experience over the last few days. That is the absolute, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to leave it to him to tell the story behind it because it is entertaining, but I don't want to steal his thunder and I'm sure he will enjoy another retelling of that particular story. But Owen Chew, no, with all of the antelope species, they tend to be very wary of people. They generally avoid any kind of confrontation. Nyala do habituate to people more easily than some of the other antelope species, and that means that they sometimes come into conflict. So if a Nyala like that was to be cornered or felt threatened, then it might try and defend itself. And they're quite big animals. It's important to remember with all wild animals that they are much, much stronger than us. They have faster reflexes. And I've had one encounter with an Inyala male where my puppy was still learning. Uh, she grew up with Inyala wandering around all the time and she wanted to play. So she went up to investigate this particular male and he decided that actually he really didn't like her and charged her. She went racing back to the safety of mom, which in that, at that point happened to be me. She shot between my legs and the Inyala bull was so caught up in his charge that he sort of stopped there in front of me. With me standing down, it's probably one of the most frightening charges I've ever had in my life, which is ridiculous, because I've been charged by lots of things. But this one, you know, when you're shouting and shouting and clapping and trying to tell the thing to stop and it's so distracted, you actually start to wonder if you're about to get smacked by Inyala, which would be very, Unusual. I mean, the only person I know of who's actually had a very close encounter with Anyala is Brent. But Owen Tube, you'll have to just stay tuned for that particular story. I don't, I don't want to steal Brent's thunder. Good morning, Hornbulls. <laughs> oh. oh. We're just going to get the display of these two hornbills. I think they might do their little head bob. Come on, guys. For new viewers, work on your bird list. Being very vocal. These two red bulls. There we go. <laughs> this is a mated pair that are displaying to each other and the other hornbills in the area. I'm not sure if that other red bull with them is one of their previous offspring. It could well be. Hornbills stick around with their parents even after they've grown up. And they help them with their nests and to raise the next set of chicks. It's known as cooperative breeding. Uh, oh, and it sounds as though Brent has found another unusual bird to show you. So I know a lot of our birders out there, um, we've been trying to get a good view of this kingfisher species for you. I know it's not the best, but it could be a new one for your list. So we're just gonna get a safety shot from here. It's a gray hooded kingfisher. So definitely the most rare of the Hallison kingfisher species we get here. You can see his head bobbing. I'm gonna try to sneak a bit closer. And hopefully we'll get a nice view. I know Mike in Florida was really looking for this bird to add to his bird list. So hopefully Mike is watching this morning and can add the 
and comment. Great hooded king for sure. Ah, the tall. But you never gone far. Andrew, you better be on fire now. <laughs> A pity. Um, anyway, we did get a little view of him there, a grey hooded kingfisher. So we haven't been able to find any of these male leopard tracks, uh, and uh, and you guys have been having a, quite a discussion uh, about uh, an experience VM and I had last weekend. Actually, I think it's a week today. It was a Saturday last week. Uh, it wasn't attacked by a Liniana per se. Uh, uh, it was quite leaped upon. Uh, it was one of those fluke, fluke things that happens. Um, Viam was kindly giving me a lift back to uh, my house and uh, in the rain, and I didn't feel like walking in the rain. And as we drove out of the, the Juma research camp, wild dogs which were chasing an Inyana and an adult female jam jumped through VM's passenger window and landed on my lap and got stuck between the windscreen and me, kicked me up quite a bit, so it did some good, good work on my, my ribs, uh, back on my head, and also had lots of shards of glass stuck in my legs. Actually, one came out only yesterday, uh, and uh, Unfortunately, we weren't filming when it happened, but uh, if you want to have a look at the aftermath, if you just go to my Facebook page, um, you will see uh, there's a little video there showing what happened to Liam's car. And uh, the female Nyala is a surprisingly big animal when it's on top of you, but uh, to cut a long story short, eventually I managed to grab its back legs and pop it on my lap. lap. Liam said it looked like I was holding a big dog. Imagine that Nyala around the waist like this to stop those hooves kicking me, uh, and I then just turfed her out the window. I couldn't open the door um, due to the fact that from the impact of the Nyala that the door was jammed shut. But yeah, quite a scary experience, and we were very, very lucky uh, to come out as unscathed as we did. It could have been a lot worse, and thankfully it was a female uh, and not a male, and I'm not sure what happened to that Nyala, but it ran off at speed after being turfed out the window. So, not sure what happened to it after that. So, the awesome one who was a, a new viewer, we had a, we welcomed onto the live drive a little bit earlier. Uh, it says, this is something I've got to start watching more often. We agree wholeheartedly and welcome to the Safari Live family. They're just looking for tracks or they're actually looking for the real animal. Well, it's not generally, uh, when, if you keep following the tracks, if you're lucky, you'll find the animal creating them. So we are looking for the animal. Uh, and uh, the best way to find a lot of these animals out here in the bush is to track them. So, and especially in the early morning like we are now, while it's nice and cool, um, the tracks are nice and fresh. They ha uh, the wind hasn't blown, it hasn't moved them. So we're able to find what direction uh, the, the, that animal's been going, and hopefully uh, the, the end goal is uh, to uh, find that animal. And also, uh, Scott is having a, a nap this morning, uh, a well-deserved little rest. So we rotate, and my name is Brent. And that's Andrew Joseph, whose hands you see occasionally appearing uh, behind my head. There we go, like that. And of course, on the other vehicle is Jamie and Tibbs this morning. Listen. 
Lapa says, speaking of striped animals, so the cousin, and this is referring and asking after the cousin of the Nyala, the Kudu, said she hasn't seen any pregnant herds of Kudu recently. Are they around? Uh, they are around. I actually saw, when did we see? I saw some Kudu yesterday. Uh, I think it was after, oh, when I was out uh, tracking. Uh, they are around and uh, could, you, could be pregnant at any time of the year. They're not them in Yala and Bushbuck, who are all sort of cousins, trafalegids, spiral horned antelope. Uh, they all uh, give birth at any time of the year and are not fixed on a, on a, a cycle like wildebeest and uh, impala. So let's see if we can find the queen. Oh, the tuba. So, uh, Austin seems like great minds think come out. Uh, I think I like Austin, who's 13, was asking, are Kudu and Inyala uh, related? Well, well spotted, you can see they're of a similar family, um, and Bushback is the, the final sort of. Uh, one we get and see here regularly of the spiral horned antelope family. And uh, so good 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 observation skills there, Austin. And uh, the truffle legged happen to be a favorite of mine, not when they're jumping through the window, of course. Uh, but my, probably I think my favorite antelope uh, is the bushback. Incredible little guys, very, very beautiful. Uh, and uh, Scott's been, Scott and Nikki have been making friends with a bushbuck. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the video by Scott. Uh, he was going for a shower one evening uh, in the outside shower, and a bushbuck beat him to it and uh, was having a nap inside his shower. One of the fun things about living in the bush is all those little things that happen to us. to be privileged to live in this wild area. Chatting about spiral horned antelope, uh, Erwin Tube uh, would like to know what is an Inyala's main food source? Perfect. So one of their favorite foods is this little very bright tree growing right next to us. And if we have a look, you can actually see where the broken branches are to the right, where it's been a little bit up there, Andrew. There we go. It's been nipped. Um, it is a buffalo thorn. So Inyalas are browsers, so that means they eat leaves. So they feed on quite a, a wide host of different tree species, but this being one of their favorites. And imagine that while we stop there. There's a sunbird nest. Can you see it, Andrew? No. Here we go. It looks like a little white-bellied sunbird's nest. Just going to have a closer look with me. See where the entrance is? Got to be careful because this buffalo thorn that it's in um, it's got very sharp hook thorns. And this one doesn't look like it's used. It looks like it's a bit old. Um, the entrance is on the other side, but it's getting a bit thin uh, around the bottom and stuff, so I don't think this is in use at the moment. So quite a lot of the sunbirds, interestingly enough, will build nests like that, uh, and they'll even collect and harvest uh, spider webs, and they use the spider webs to stick the nest together. So it's made up of ooh, dry leaves and, uh, and grass and, and twigs and that, but all stuck together by using spiders, a uh, spider's webs. Oh, what do you got there, Andrew? Spider. Oh, there we go, there's a community spider at nest. Well spotted, Andrew. And obviously probably got harvested quite heavily for the building of that little sunbird nest. I think I just saw a spider walking along there, but there we go. So there's this community spider nest, and there's the sunbird nest. Now community spiders are one of the few communal or group living spiders in the world and they live in small little colonies.
So, Sailor, the new viewer is now getting into the question asking. And uh, Sailor would like to know, do the buffalo like this tree if it's called the buffalo thorn? Well, that is very true. So buffalo are generally grazers, so they eat grass, but occasionally uh, one of the trees they will eat is the buffalo thorn. Uh, I have another little, I'm just going to collect a little branchlet of that buffalo thorn and tell you guys a story while we continue to search for leopards. So it's a very um, important tree in quite a lot of the Nguni cultures uh, in southern Africa. This final one has got a really nice example of what I want to show you. We'll take a dry branch, not a, a green one. Oh, but before we leave it, also, boom, if you ever want to add something extra to your salad while you're out in the bush, nice and tasty. That's why all the animals like it. And um, it is edible to humans, as you can see. Yum, 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 yum. Pop that there. So, before we get moving, I'll show you quickly. See, buffalo thorn is quite unique in the fact it's got one straight thorn and one hook thorn. So, hook thorn, straight thorn. And uh, that will become very important in the story I'm about to tell you. So, as we move on, I will tell you. So, uh, in quite a few of the Nguni cultures, particularly the Zulu culture, um, the buffalo thorn is a, is a vessel to transport spirits of departed loved ones. So, when loved ones die away from their traditional home, uh, a family member will be sent to the area where they have been buried that is away from uh, their traditional home. And uh, what will happen is a buffalo thorn branch, uh, probably a little bit bigger than this one, um, will be chosen very, very carefully. And it will then travel with that family member to the area where their family member has died. And it will be placed on the grave. And the hooked thorn captures their spirit into this vessel for transporting loved ones. And uh, then that branch will travel back to their uh, sort of ancestral home. Quite often so this happens in northern Zululand where it's, it's sort of uh, quite rural and a lot of traditional beliefs still exist. And so that branch will be transported. That branch will also be looked after like it is a person. So if I was transporting uh, my family member and I wanted to have a Coke, a cola, or, or a, a fruit juice, I would then also buy the branch of fruit juice. When I bought a meal for myself, I'd then buy a meal for, 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 the, for the spirit. Uh, and if I'm taking a bus, I would buy a bus ticket and the branch would have its own seat in the bus. So, really, really fascinating. So then, once that spirit has returned home and, and traveled and, and, and been uh, treated exactly like a, a human would, uh, it is in proper old Zulu tradition. Um, there's an ancestral hut where the ancestors live in it, normally the closest to the, the sort of cattle kraal, um, and where uh, that's the ancestors of Zulu, Zulu really love their cows. And, uh, be the closest out there. This branch will then be placed um, in that ancestral hut, or, or in the, or even in the cattle kraal in some in some in some cases. And uh, the straight thorn will release the spirit again. So the hook thorn catches the spirit, and then that long straight thorn will release the spirit, and uh, it can go join the rest of its ancestors and its ancestral home. So absolutely fascinating there that the buffalo thorn 
Um, it has also got another quite a fun name after quite a serious story about dead things or dead people uh, in Afrikaans, uh, which is a language we have here in South Africa that's a derivative of Dutch. It's called a Vach Abiki Bos. Actually, it's called a Blink Blar Vach Abiki Bos. Basically, that means a shining leaf, wait a bit tree. It's called a wait a bit tree because of these thorns. And if you get stuck in it, uh, you have to wait quite a bit while you remove yourself or extricate yourself from those thorns. I missed that. The game drive radio was going, so I'm just... Mike, I know you were asking something. I'm just checking. Give me a second. Ah, there we go. Mike was asking, what is a weight of a plant? There we go. Uh, it is the buffalo thorn. Uh, for those of you who like to go a little bit more fancy-smancy, uh, the scientific name is Zizifus macronatum. So Jamie's just trying to get hold of me on the radio. Standing by, Jamie. All right, nigga, go for it. I'm on my way back towards last tracks now. We had no luck with um, bad audio, so let's start again. Jogging away. All right, so ground hornbill, an endangered species. I can actually see three, four at the moment. And oh, there was something, and it was swallowed very quickly. I'm just going to try and move it a little bit further forward. Um, actually, uh, those of you who've been watching or listening to the Juma Dam Cam might have heard them calling this morning. One of the really beautiful and distinctive calls in the African bush. It's sort of wonderful. Do, 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 do. There we go. So an endangered species, there's less than 235 mating pairs uh, left. And very long-lived species live to about 45 years. And we're going to try and have a look if we can see if they're male or female. Um, and it's, it can be quite difficult, especially at this range. I'm just going to use my binos quickly. So that one in shot at the moment. What do you say, Andrew? I'm going for male. And uh, I'm afraid Andrew is uh, incorrect. Oh. It was a female. The one, the one behind it was a male. Unfortunately, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't get a sex on the last one. Uh, it disappeared before I could uh, get it. So uh, the reason we very closely check sexes on, on ground hornbills is um, we are part or we help aid an ongoing uh, project that is obviously with all endangered species. Um, it is quite important uh, to try keep a note on them and, and keep, keep a note on numbers. So if we have a look here, so the male, uh, the cask, which is this ridge on the top of the beak, is slightly more prominent, and the female has a blue spot in the middle of her throat. And that's the big difference. So I definitely had one male, one female there. I unfortunately didn't get the, the, the sex of the last one. And with a lot of things like endangered species, we're not going to sort of harass them at all. We'll just let them be. Uh, hopefully we'll maybe bump into them a little bit later on a more open, in a more open spot. Uh, but endangered species, only 235 breeding herds. I mean, breeding herds, breeding pairs. Uh, and... So we do constantly, if we see them, uh, mark the area we've seen them and the sexes and send that through to the researchers. And uh, the reason they're so endangered is that when in the sort of, from the 20s onwards, when we didn't really know much about some of the insecticides and poisons we were using, um, 
to wipe out uh, the farmers to wipe out uh, sort of crop raiders. A lot of those poisons uh, transferred onto some of your your other animals. So ox peckers and and hornbills, uh, ground hornbills in particular, were heavily hit by by that. But they're both good news. Both their numbers are coming up slowly. Most definitely, you look at that massive beak, they're able to sort of crack them open. Uh, of course, very uncomfortable for your tortoise, but it's a really nice big meal if you're a hornbill. So, I'm just checking here, the last tracks of Madame Karula I had were over there before we rushed off to go see if we could find that male who was calling. loves a termite mound and there's a couple of nice ones in the distance. I just want to have a quick look, see if she's not resting on top of one. Uh, she's not. Uh, termite mounds, the reason a leopard loves a termite mound is it gives them a wonderful high vantage point uh, so they can look for potential prey uh, or potential threats. So, uh, have a quick look here, the last tracks were just here. That Wayne in Philadelphia would like to know do they roar or purr? So Wayne's actually brought up quite an interesting thing. Cats that can roar can't purr, and cats that can purr can't roar. Aha, uh -huh, isn't that amazing? So a leopard, it's called sawing, but it, it, it is a form of roaring. Um, and the cat species that belong to the family Panthera, uh, which is your large cats. Uh, are generally the ones that can roar. So lion, leopard, jaguar, tiger, and uh, your others are the ones that purr. And these are very beautiful uh, torchwood tree, or Balanites morgami, also sometimes known as a green thorn. Uh, I'm still just trying to find that last Petite and the beautiful little leopard track of Karula, the Queen of Juma. And um, there we go, there she is. That's the last track right there. So I'm going to get Andrew to, Andrew, Andrew to show it to you. There you go, there's Karula's little footprint. Um, and Monkey Man, uh, who, or AKA Joey, who's in Australia, uh, would like to know if a lot of the animals rea react negatively uh, to the upright, the bipedal figure of man as the dominant diurnal uh, predator. Is it possible that uh, if we crawled on all fours, would we elicit a different reaction? Uh, most definitely, Joey, that would would happen. And uh, but uh, the problem is we're not really good on all fours, so it, sometimes it might be a negative thing. They might still move away. And when you're walking with uh, with with non-predatory species, so so your your herbivores, uh, if you walk upright and straight past them, they know we're not like a lion. We can't run fast enough to catch them. We have to rely on our brain to. So uh, as soon as you start stalking, you start displaying. Um, predatory behavior, which will actually cause them to run away. Um, with with predators, um, it also probably would be a little bit, sorry, I just, the game drive channel's going off there. I just want to listen quickly before I take a walk. Um, but no. while I'm going to go walk, 
and see where the last track of Krula actually disappears to, we're going to go join Jamie, who's on her way to a different spotted animal. And while Brent goes off in search of Krula, you've come across at just the right time as we make our way towards the spotted hyena den. My favourite predator to sit and watch, always entertaining. And let's keep our fingers crossed that the newest members of the hyena clan decide to make an appearance this morning. Notice lots and lots of hyena tracks wandering around where the lions had that kill this morning. The hyenas have been moving through that area. They also wander across towards where that dead hippo was, although I think that that carcass is now largely eaten. Good morning, smellies. How are you? Who have we got here? This is so fascinating. It really, really is. I'm talking about the dynamic between the matriarch and her older cub. Bella. Oh, sorry, not Bella. Yes, Bella. Look at this. This is so interesting. Good morning, Smelly One, Two, and Three. So we've got June lying down in the front. Hello. Hello, Mischief. Are you sleepy? Did you have a long night? What were you up to? Hello. Looking good, huh? <laughs> Oh, just at the age where it's going to be wandering around. But have a look up at what's happening here. There's the new mom, the matriarch of this particular clan, a hyena I like to call Madam. Now, she's got two brand new cubs. And yet, there is... Well, it's hard for me to confirm exactly, but I'm fairly certain that that's Bella lying with her. And that is so interesting because it shows the bond between mother and her suspected son, how strong that is. Is she gonna call? Come on, big girl. A nice call for us. She's looking down into the entrance of the den to see if her little new cubs will pop out. So for those of you new to the hyena den, they hide their cubs in these tunnels in termite mounds. as a way of protecting them. And the entrances to the holes are big enough for the mothers to lie in the entrance, but they get progressively narrower as you go into the tunnel. This is actually a really beautiful den site. It's all nicely shaded, as Tibbs just showed us. A perfect place for them. Good morning, guys. You've been sleepy. And as always, Madam looks particularly well-fed. Not sure what she was up to last night. Yes, I'm talking about you. No sign of the other two moms. So for new arrivals or new what new viewers, the spotted hyena clan, the one at this active den site, we've got three sets of cubs, all under the age of about three months old, hiding in this termite mound. And there, a couple of them are just at the stage where they're starting to get their spots. November and the December twins. Oh, my word. Here's the, here's the pungent odor washing over us. Now, I love spotted hyenas, but they're not the most hygienic of creatures. Goodness me, this den is really starting to acquire quite the scent. And essentially what happens is the cubs themselves defecate and urinate around the den. Often the Females bring back, or the young sub-adults bring back, bits of carcass to chew on. They also always are anal pasting around the den, which is something that is very intrinsic to hyena society. And what that means is that over time, the den site acquires quite the odor. And at that point, at that point the hyenas will have to move. I'm glad you... You guys are all happy that we've come to the hyena den. I love to check in every couple of days just to see what's happening because you never know when they decide to move just due to that buildup of parasites and 
move off and it'll take us a while before we find the new den site unless we get lucky and they use one of their previous ones have a look since we've been carrying on a theme of tracks and feet you can actually have a look at the little paws of that one sub-adult you can see the pads oh, i was looking i was looking at bella um yeah we won't be able i think june shifted so we won't be able to see but there you can see the little feet look at the way that those toes all tessellate they all fit together making almost like a puzzle piece awesome thank you tebs and there you can sort of see the what i was chatting a bit about with that lion track and with caitlin and kayla's question about three lobes and two lobes hyenas is the clearest example of the two lobes at the back so that back pad that i'm chatting about behind the toes you can see how clearly defined the two lobes are at the back and you can actually also really nicely in hyenas in particular you can really see the size difference between the front and the back feet even on a sub-adult like bella the front feet and it's particularly pronounced in hyena the front feet and their shoulders are much bigger than their back ends and that's because it provides muscle attachments for those powerful bone crushing jaws that they have you'll also be able to see it in the tracks themselves they crosswalk unlike any other animal now i've said that most animals have larger front feet than they have back feet when we were chatting earlier there is an exception to that in the predators and i'm fairly certain our regular viewers will know what it is but i'm going to offer it up to you as a quiz anyway which particular predator has larger back feet than it has front feet bonus point if you can get the antelope species that has larger back feet than it does front feet two different examples let's see if you can let me know what you think hello madam are we looking at one of the top predators in this reserve and it's fascinating always it's it's one of the interactions that's the most incredible to watch is the interaction between the different species of predators now out here these spotted hyenas are in serious competition with the lions and it generally is a numbers game if there's lots of hyenas as there is in this clan we've got a much better chance and we were actually chatting last night to some of the guides on simbombili just as an interesting aside and apparently the clan on in and around elephant plains is absolutely enormous and they're regularly chasing lions away from the area so how interesting is that i mean obviously the guys are still seeing lions but they're getting to see some really incredible predator interactions between the two of them oh such a sleepy cub did you have a long night last night what were you up to were you munching on buffalo <laughs> this little cub is close to eight months old now maybe nine months old depending it was still a tiny little black ball of fluff when i started working here in july now michael fleetwood just on the subject of predator interaction so for new viewers all predators will in their interaction attempt to kill the offspring of another it it depends on the situation obviously but if they see an opportunity they will take it and the reason behind that is it reduces the competition for them and their own offspring so michael fleetwood wants to know whether or not leopards ever kill hyena cubs now i would not be at all surprised if there are recorded examples personally i've never seen it but we have seen tingana that big male dominant male leopard we have seen him enter straight into a warthog burrow before and pull out a warthog is there any reason why they wouldn't be able to do that with hyena cubs mm. tunnels are a little bit tinier and the cubs themselves construct nice shelves but i wouldn't be surprised if there are recorded cases where leopards have killed spotted hyena cubs it's a general rule of competition out here that they will take opportunities if they have them all curled up 
June's getting a bit big to fit into the den. Another interesting idea, something that we don't, or oh, I hadn't actually considered, but a really good question from James Richards, who was wondering whether baboons would ever raid a hyena den. My suggestion would be no, but baboons are not animals to be trifled with. So if there is ever competition between hyenas and baboons, it would be incredibly interesting to witness. Um, there's lots and lots of stories of leopards and baboons coming into conflict, and there are even recorded cases of large male baboons killing leopards. They are, despite the fact that they are omnivores and they often sit and eat fruit and pluck fruit from the trees, they are really quite fiercely powerful, and a big male baboon could quite easily challenge a leopard in terms of access, and they do like to eat meat. They've got canines that are larger than a leopard. In fact, I've seen some baboons that look like they would rival lions in their tooth department, so really big, powerful animals. Whether or not they would deliberately raid a hyena den, I would suggest not. Generally, hyenas are more powerful than leopards, particularly female leopards. A big male leopard could maybe challenge a hyena. But for big female hyena, sitting at around close to 60, 70 kilograms, which is about 140 odd pounds, I don't think a baboon would raid a hyena den. I don't know for certain though. It seems unlikely to me. I don't think that they would risk having to be that vulnerable on the ground without the option of being able to escape back up into a tree away from a defensive mother hyena. And I know often the cubs are left alone during the day. The mothers tend to move off, find a nice shady spot in a drainage line. I don't know though. I'll, I'll check in with the other presenters, see if they've ever heard of any cases like that. I'd be curious to know. Now this spotted hyena clan we've become very familiar with, but there's another hyena species that I think we would be absolutely jumping up and down if we ever had a chance to see them. And Austin, who is 13, you wanted to know about the different species of hyena. So the other hyena species that we get out here is a brown hyena. Now, it's quite unusual to see them in this particular area of the Sabi Sands. They like to find nice, rockier areas, and they are fairly outcompeted by the spotted hyenas here. But you never know. I know that one was seen on a live safari once. You just never know when one might decide to wander through. They're much more nomadic than these spotted hyenas tend to be, and they wander far and wide. But also, I'm going to show you a picture of what a... Are the cubs coming out? No. I'm going to show you a, a picture of the brown hyena and then I'm going to chat a little bit about the other species that we get. So this is the brown hyena. Very, very similar in size, slightly smaller than our spotted hyenas, but with a very brown shaggy coat. They look, in the darkness I've often noticed, they sort of almost look like collies. They're about the same size as a collie dog and with that thick fur, almost looks similar. And their tracks, in brown hyena, if you ever want to tell the difference between spotted and brown hyena, their tracks are, the size difference is more pronounced. So their front feet are enormous, their back feet are tiny, tiny. It almost looks as though they're walking with a cub, that difference is so pronounced. And just to give you a sense of scale, actually, since this is a nice picture of it, we've got a nice comparison here. This is the average size man, I assume, probably slightly bigger than I am. You can see how the spotted hyena sits in relation to brown hyena. Roughly similar in size, but the spotted hyena is much bulkier. And interestingly, the spotted hyena is the one, is the only species of hyena with the females being dominant and having those pseudo penises. Brown hyenas don't have that at all. So that's what makes their evolution so interesting. One last picture to show you. A species that has been fiercely argued in terms of whether or not it belongs in the hyena family and actually has a different Latin name. So the hyenas fall under the crocuta 
um, Latin name. The aardwolf is completely separate to it, but still included within the family due to the structure of the feet as well as the structure of the anal glands. But little aardwolves are very, very different. They're much smaller and their diet is entirely termite based. So something unusual, you can see they don't have the same a powerful bone crushing jaws because they don't need to. They've evolved to eat termites. Now, Brent was having quite a long discussion with some of the other guides in the area as to whether or not they've ever seen Artfark. Apparently, the crew has seen Artfark twice driving from here to Manuleti, and Brent thinks that he saw Aardwolf tracks in the sand. So, can you imagine if we came round the corner one evening and found an Aardwolf sitting in the road? It would be epic. The one other hyena species that we don't get here is a striped hyena and that's much further north up into Africa. So they don't occur here, but roughly similar in size to the spotted hyenas and the brown hyenas. And for new viewers, I chatted and I touched a little bit on the females being bigger. And yes, in spotted hyenas, the females are much bigger and stronger. Where are you off to, Bella? Going for a wonder. The hyena at the entrance to the den still lying looking very peaceful come on girls we need to see your cubs now we need to see your babies and well done to terry donna and siberia zumi and lots of others you got the answer to my quiz right for the larger back pad, oh, sorry, the larger back feet of a predator. You are absolutely correct. It is indeed the cheetah. And cheetah's back feet are considerably larger than their front feet. And if you think about the way that they're adapted to run and to sprint, you can see why. It is an increase in traction. And Donna, Natasha, and Jared, you've suggested for the antelope species that it's a kudu. But now what's interesting about this quiz is that I've actually caught myself out because I'm not sure whether kudu's back, back feet are bigger than their front feet. I was thinking of blue wildebeest, but maybe kudu do. I don't think so though. Blue wildebeest, particularly in the males, their back feet are rounder and larger than the front feet. And that's partly because they actually spend quite a lot of time with their interdigital gland that sits between the halves of the hoof. They've got a scent gland there, or a pedal gland, that they scrape along the ground, and that's actually worn away the front part of their track. And although their back track is larger, it's also rounder than the front track from that scraping. Could it? I don't think so, but maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Caught myself out there. I'm going to go check. Next time I see a kudu, I'm going to go and examine its feet really closely, see if I can have a look at its tracks as it walks. I'm trying to picture it in my head. I've seen kudu tracks so many times, and they register, so they fall on, the back foot falls over the front foot. So it should be fairly easy to see if they... No, I don't think so with kudu. Their front, their front halves are so big, particularly in the males, with all of that weight. Hmm. We'll have to... I have to double check. I better fact check myself. <laughs> I've given you a quiz that I'm not sure about the answer to. Bella's wandered off somewhere. I don't know where she, he's gone. about the size difference with the females. Eric in Virginia Beach, you've asked a question that actually nobody really knows the answer to. So Eric wants to know why do, why are spotted hyenas such an exception to that general rule? In most of the mammal species, almost all of the mammal species, the male is bigger than the female. So why have spotted hyena evolved with the females having such high levels of androgen, testosterone, essentially evolving reproductive organs that are make what they are intended purposes for incredibly difficult so the females especially new mothers 
really, really struggle to give, give birth through those pseudo penises. So Eric, there's a couple of theories. The predominant one is the big mother theory. So in order, the, the theory sort of goes that in order to compete, particularly with lions in terms of reproductive success and numbers, because obviously the more hyena, the more you can compete. And particularly given in certain areas, the nomadic lifestyle of the spotted hyenas, not less so here, but more in the desert areas, the animals have to travel far and wide. And what that's led to is mothers trying to produce offspring, feeding them the best and the highest protein content milk. So the bigger the animal, the bigger the female, the better they can produce that milk. The, the further they can range, the more access to food they can gobble and then return back to their cubs and feed them and give them the best milk. So that's the big mother theory. It's, it's quite difficult to explain and I don't think it fully explains exactly why it is that these hyenas have evolved. I mean, we're currently looking at one of the biggest hyenas I have seen, um, just not necessarily in terms of height, but in terms of bulk. Madam is particularly large. I think that's what's made her the matriarch or what's led to her being the matriarch. It's a combination of genetic size factor and then also the fact that she will have had the best access to food throughout her life. Whether or not she has higher levels of testosterone, I'm not entirely sure. She certainly has a swagger to her. But there's, the answer to your question, Eric, is that no one really knows exactly what has led to this evolution. It's what makes spotted hyenas so fascinating. And it's tied in to the questions about how it was that they evolved the social structure that they did with these strict clan hierarchies, with a matriarch or a queen of the clan sitting at the top and then the subordinates below her and unrelated hyenas, so different matrial lineal lines, all living together in one clan. Makes sense, helps to increase or boost numbers, meaning that they can compete for access to food, especially with lions and the other predators. It's an interesting one. What we do know is that hyenas produce some of the best milk of any of the mammal species out here. And you can see it, you can see it working in practice, the way that the cubs have grown an incredible amount. And even though it's been a while since we've seen June's mother, for example, we're looking at June at the moment, by the way, this little sub-adult line here, it's been a while since we've seen the mom. That doesn't necessarily mean that she isn't coming to the den, it just means that we haven't been here at times when she does. And for a sub-adult of June's age, she would still be suckling and that's also another factor, is the, f uh, the fact that hyenas lactate for longer. Because they're bigger, they can afford to. The females can provide or can get the nutrients needed to provide those high levels of lactation all the way up to about a year old, sometimes even a year and a half, that hyena cubs will lactate. Uh, no, sorry, that hyena cubs will be suckling and their mothers will be lactating. one of the things that fascinates me. I, I sit and think about it a lot. Uh, I've mentioned that I really, really like this den site. And it's so nice and protected. It sits right in a Tabwerti thicket. The access to the den is therefore controlled by the hyenas. But Ellen in Arkansas, you were wondering whether or not neighboring clans would ever fight over access to a better den site than others. For example, with nice access to water or maybe a secured spot like this. To the best of my knowledge, they don't really fight so much over den sites, but they will fight over territory. So they often get clan wars, which can be incredibly violent and very serious if rival clans or neighboring clans encounter each other at some point on a territorial boundary. So spotted hyenas are strictly territorial. We've actually worked out the exact, pretty much the exact boundary of our Juma clan 
versus the one that moves across on Arethusa and Elephant Plains. And that sits, there's almost like a no man zone, if that makes sense. Our clan has placed middens all the way up our western boundary on Triple M itself. And the other clan has placed middens, or latrines as they're actually called, where they regularly defecate to mark territorial boundaries. They've put that all along one road to the west of that. So it's like they have a, a buffer zone almost, if that makes sense. And there's really interesting, literally straight lines of latrines all the way along. So they'll fight over better territory, so better access to food, more scavenging opportunities, good water, and maybe within that, Ellen, I suppose, ideal den sites. So yes, in a way, they'll compete for den sites, but not the particular den site. It's more an area where there are possible den sites, if that makes sense. This is a really nice den. There's a hole on the left that is generally where Pretty and Corky tend to, so the two mothers of the older cubs, they tend to spend time there. And the tunnel links all the way through to the right-hand tunnel. Oh, I just wanted to check in with our hyenas. They're not up to much at the moment. So let's go and have a look at Brent's bird of prey. So, unfortunately, no luck with the leopard, but we've got another apex predator, an apex predator of the air. And uh, it's not one we've seen for a while. And I wonder if our bird is out there can uh, guess what it is uh, and if you do know send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv uh, or use the hashtag safari live on twitter really big eagle but which big eagle why don't you give us three choices at least oh andrew andrew that would be giving away too much of the game got to keep our viewers sharp So a beautiful big aquila eagle, so it is a true eagle. I'll give you that a hint, narrow it down for, uh, for you a little bit. And it's also a resident eagle, so it doesn't migrate. So while you guys try to figure out what that is, we've got another bird questioner from Chris Rogue, um, who would like to know, are the carmine eaters still around? We've only seen them once with Jamie. Uh, and they are, but there are going to be very few of them this year. It's the same reason there's fewer woodlands, kingfishers, fewer European rollers. Uh, they're chasing the rain. They need that rain uh, for the burst of insects that it produces. So we might see them again, but they're definitely not as uh, common as they were last wet season. So just a quick update. Unfortunately, uh, Queen Karula, I'm quite confident, has, has left us for now. She's moved out of our Travis area. Uh, we heard Impala alarm calling. Yeah, the Impala that were alarm calling and we rushed to this area. She was also calling um, when I was on foot following the tracks. Uh, we were just behind her, unfortunately, just uh, probably uh, five to 10 minutes too late uh, to catch her before she crossed. But with every leopard that leaves, there's a possibility of another arriving. So I'm um, gonna have a better look for uh, that male that Aubrey heard calling this morning. So I'm checking our southern boundary and somewhere in this area to see if I can find any tracks. Now what I wonder, is Karula in the mood for love? Is that why I heard her calling? And it was a male calling. Maybe she's looking at to mate again. So it'll be interesting to see uh, and find out if any of the other uh, game drives from surrounding us actually might find her with the male. So, 
Alice and Natasha and Marianne, you've gone for the bait, hook, line and sinker, saying it is a pale morph warbird eagle. It's not. It is a pale morph eagle, but not a warbird. So let's see if anyone can get a bit further than the warbird. The warbird is much smaller, and remember, it's got that very distinct little crest on the back of its head. says, is it a juvenile fish eagle? Uh, it's not. Uh, uh, we have two South Africans who are in Saudi Arabia, uh, Penny and Gerard, uh, who have got it right. Oh, so Penny's in SA, Gerard is in Saudi Arabia, who have got it spot on. It is a pale morph tawny eagle. So maybe that might not be one some of you had on your uh, bird list. show you the picture of the Warburgs and why it's not a Warburgs. Vultures, eels. And on the, the power line is a European roller, but when it gets to the eagles, they're the vultures, the snake eagles. Where have the true eagles decided to migrate out of my book? No, there they are. There we go, a pale morph uh, tawny eagle, uh, also sometimes referred to as a rufous morph. Uh, they do have sort of in between. Uh, one of the big giveaways uh, just was the shape of the head, very, very rounded, and also the size, it was much, much bigger. But if we have a look at, where's the Wahlbergs? So we look at the Wahlbergs. So even on the, on the pale morphs, uh, the wings tend to be a little bit darker, but it's that really distinctive head shape. They've got that appearance of a little crest, and that is a sort of big giveaway there. And uh, the other one that could have been a good gander um, would have been uh, the step eagle, uh, but you don't really get too many pale morphs. Uh, and if we look at the, the gape, which is the important thing, so the gape, uh, the set uh, of the mouth um, in a step eagle. It extends to behind the eye, um, and it's also got a red eye, where there's the tawny yellow eye, and the gape goes to the middle of the eye. Go. Let us continue. It has definitely felt like someone has turned the heating up, and uh, the temperature changed very rapidly from a very pleasant cool. Uh, to now probably uh, oh, it's getting hot quickly at the moment. So amazing, all those alleys, there must have been at least 200 elephants on uh, Juma yet during the day yesterday. Uh, and now I don't, I don't be lucky if there's two seen all the tracks and everywhere I've gone and they're all heading out uh, but at this time of the year and with these very dry conditions the Ellie's are going to be moving big distances so while we continue to check the southern boundary uh, hopefully for a surprise set of tracks coming to visit us uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to very very peaceful here at the den we've arrived a little bit late in the morning it's got to nap time already apparently full bellies and peaceful safe spots to sleep in <clears throat> now looking at this little sub-adult 
June is probably about eight months old. And Mike, you were wondering at what point a young hyena could actually survive without its mother. Now, I think that this is probably about the earliest that a young hyena could survive. They still are dependent on mom for suckling, so they still suckle from their mothers occasionally. That being said, they are eating meat, they are eating solid food, and they are moving out with the clan to go out and scavenge. So we've often seen June wandering around with the rest of the clan members. So she's about big enough to be surviving on its own. Difficult one, because sub-adult ages, or at the sub-adult age, it's probably when hyenas are most at risk anyway, because they start to roam further and further from the safety of the den, and they haven't had quite the same level of life experience that the others, the adults do, and thus aren't maybe as alert as they should be or aware of the dangers that they might encounter. But you're looking probably at about that age. I would say that for absolute security or ensuring this, the success of a baby, you're probably looking at about one and a half to two where they could exist on their, completely on their own. Now, if June's mother is not present, and I'm not saying that that is the case, I'm saying that if, if that were the case, then she's still got a chance of surviving. She'll follow, she'll stay with the clan and, or he, <laughs> she or he, would be she'll still she will stay with their clan so gordy you were wondering about where june's mom is haven't seen her it doesn't mean that she's not coming through in the middle of the night i would love to be a fly on the wall at this hyena den at all times have eyes and ears here to watch what's happening and i think that june would be more than capable of surviving if necessary i'm not sure it's a difficult one they can spend as much time as possible with their mothers. <laughs> I've said that they are one of my favorite creatures out here. And Nicole, who is watching in Memphis, you wanted to know if I've ever touched a hyena. And yes, I have. Um, I, I generally tend to follow as much of a hands-off policy as possible. However, I have been involved in game capture with both spotted hyena and with brown hyena. Nicole, I've told the story a couple of times where we, we called in because we thought that a spotted hyena had been snared at a den site, which in, now in hindsight would actually have been very, very unlike it. It wasn't in this area. It was further towards the Drakensberg Mountains. But what had actually happened was the cupboard had jumped up and hooked its foot in a raisin bush and was dangling from it. And since we were there and we were watching and this thing was struggling, it couldn't get any upwards momentum to get its foot out. We jumped out and we wrapped a jacket around the cub's head because even at the smallest age, they'd be more than capable of biting your finger and probably breaking the bones in it. We wrapped its head in a jacket, lifted it out and dropped it, let it go, put the jacket off and immediately left it to go back into the den. So in that respect I have, I've also been on game capture where the farmer or neighboring farmer on the reserve that I was on had called us in and one of his workers, it was something that the reserve encouraged. So instead of farmers shooting what they considered to be threats to their livestock, whether fair or unfairly, they had a policy that if they caught them or if they had them reported them, the reserve would go and dart them and remove them and bring them onto the reserve. And in this particular case, it was a brown hyena. And because we had her under sedation, it was quite a long journey that she had to travel and to lift her into the crate, also notch the ear to try and be able to identify her in future. And I got to spend a lot of time examining the way that their feet move, the coarseness of their fur, the smelliness, admittedly, but still amazing animals. And then I sat in the back of the, what we call in South Africa, a bucky, which is a, what would you call it? It's a pickup truck, basically, a nice open flat back truck. I sat in the back with her and watched her wake up just to make sure that everything was okay. She didn't try and injure herself trying to get out of the crate because at that point we would have had to sedate her. Released her onto the reserve and she disappeared. Um, it was a, I think it was a hard release actually. I mean, sorry, a soft release. So she was in a, a boma for a while to get used to it, to try and make sure that she didn't go back to her original home 
which is what a lot of animals tend to want to do. When they are released into a new area, when there's that level, level of interference, they try and move back to where they've come from. So what, what people do is they put them in a fenced, a slightly smaller fenced enclosure where they spend a couple of months getting used to where they are before releasing them. Depends on the species of animal. Works for some, doesn't work for others. In this case, she disappeared and wasn't seen or heard about again. I've just started the engine. I was gonna leave, but June is up. To me, still looking a little bit thin, Oh, you've got sleepy wobbles. Just wanted to move into a nicer spot. Yep. Tucking back in. <laughs> Blocking the light with, it, with its leg. Bye-bye, Smelly. Enjoy your afternoon nap. And since I'm calling it Smelly, Christopher, you wanted to know if hyenas or if spotted hyenas are the worst smelling animals. Christopher, they've got some serious competition. Look, they're, they're quite high up there on the rank of Smelly. Um, let's think. I don't, I don't know if I could do a smell ranking. Waterbuck are very, very stinky. It's not a terrible smell. It's a sort of a, a wet dog kind of scent to it. And I, I find that I, you, you adapt to those sorts of smells if you've worked out here for a long time, and they don't tend to bother you at all. So, yes, waterbuck are quite smelly. Wild dog are, can be particularly smelly. Lions, let me tell you something. If a lion's been feeding on a buffalo for four days, and munching on rotten meat, they can be incredibly pungent. What, what are the other smelly animals? Elephants smell lovely to me. Best smelling animal dung, in my opinion, if you really want to know my ranking. <laughs> my favorite animal dung to smell is that of a black rhino. It's a beautiful, fresh, I don't know how to describe it. It's got a, a lovely scent to it. It's, it's just such a, I don't know if it's because I associate that smell with the animal and it's one of my favorite animals. But yes, black rhino done. Top of the list of good smelling smells out here. Um, smelly animals, mongoose. Mongoose are smelly. <laughs> mongoose are pretty stinky. They, um, they anal paste on each other with fairly regular, um, or with monotonous regularity. So that carries quite a pungent scent. And if anyone was ever thinking about having a mongoose as a pet, not that we ever encourage such, such things, but they will also anal paste on their humans. It's a way of showing their bonding to the rest of the group. So strong smells, I've seen leopards. I mean, leopards are quite, not a bad smelling animal. I've seen them roll in lion scat. You were wondering about jackals. You were wondering if they have quite a bad smell. I don't think I've ever smelled a jackal. Oh, Gerard, you know that they have a bad smell. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize what you were asking, but you say they do have a bad smell. Yes, that makes sense. I think if I'm completely honest, most things out here carry their own unique scent. Zebra, you get the fresh scent of grass wafting over you due to the nature of their digestive system. Same goes for elephants. <laughs> and Eric. <laughs> Eric is watching in Virginia Beach. You've come up with a new acronym for your dung challenge. Eric has suggested DRC, the Dung Recognition Challenge. There's something that actually I should really get this going now, now that Brent and Scott are both back. Steph didn't want to play along. So Eric's Dung Recognition Challenge essentially consists of blindfolding the presenter concerned and placing before them the vast array of 
uh, products of defecation, let's put it that way, in front of us. And at that point, we either we won't do it by taste, obviously, um, <laughs> but maybe by smell and by feel, the guides have to identify the dung, and the winner gets to keep the dung. Is there no better prize? I love it. <laughs> maybe this is something we should get going now. It could be quite interesting. Some of the antelope dung will be really difficult to do blindfolded. <laughs> Eric, I'll have a chat. Let's see if we can get Scott and Brent on board. Maybe we can play a good, good game of dung recognition. Oh, and I seem to remember a requirement of it was that the dung has to be fresh. Oh, my goodness. Let's see, let's see how that suggestion goes down. While I head off in search of other things, let's pop over to Brent for an update. So it sounds like my girlfriend is talking a lot about food. It's a little bit worrying. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I'm in on the dung recognition, but I also heard she was talking about anal pasting uh, in mongoose. And uh, growing up, I've had a, uh, as a family, we've had a few pet uh, banded mongoose. We used to get visitors who worked from the bush. And the first thing Lord Montague, the mongoose, used to do was anal paste on their feet, uh, which sent quite a lot of silly dwellers jumping up in yelps and screams, which only provided to make Lord Montague very excitable and ended up biting a lot of them on their toes. So, uh, so one of those, sometimes uh, having a pets of the unusual very nice, but also it does come with a few uh, less than uh, <laughs> uh, normal uh, behavior aspects. So the reason they do it to people is because you are now their, their business, their, you are their family. So uh, anyone who comes into your territory, uh, especially with males, uh, needs to be added to the family doesn't like you or you don't want to let him do it, it can lead to a vicious attack. And even though mongoose are quite small, they do have very, very sharp teeth. See it? You might fly. Tiny little bird. You left. Oh, there it goes. As soon as I got it. Oh, uh, it's a little blue wax bill. <laughs> have any big cat tracks to follow, let's give a little tracking lesson. Can you see what I'm looking at, Andrew? Yeah, that little, looks like a little triangle almost on the side of the road. I'm going to jump out now. There we go. Maybe go to the one a little bit further back so I can actually see the gaps between them. Or is it, maybe we need to just be actually more above it. Dent. How's that? Okay. So, very distinct little set of tracks here. And uh, I'm gonna, the ones we're looking at are these here. And it's, uh, you can see four different feet. That's the back, the hind legs, and those are the front legs. And there's a couple of different species that always, or not always, but quite often make a track like this when they're, when they're on the move. So it's always the two back are a little bit wider and then the two front almost like that. It almost always forms a little triangle. You can draw, and draw up and a triangle in the direction that they're going. So from this size, I know what one of those three species it is. It's one of the more common species that we get out here, one of the little ones. But I think it's going to be too easy um, to, 
tell you what it is right off the bat. So let's see uh, who can try to figure out what it is. We haven't seen one this morning. Um, I wonder if Andrew even knows what it is, Andrew. Of course I know. Of course he knows. Well, what we'll do is once we get a few answers from you guys, we'll get Andrew to answer first, uh, and we'll see how clever he is or how clever he thinks he is. Uh, so there we go. And if you want to play the track ID, uh, Remember, if you think you know what it is, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. So what I'm doing is I'm back on the quarantine clearance. Because there are some ruler fruit, and the ones that have fallen to the ground might start ripening a little bit earlier, even though most of them are rock hard and green at the moment. I'm hoping that although all the big breeding herds of elephants have departed for a different area at the moment, could still get some bulls around and they have been really enjoying the quarantine area so i was hoping maybe we can find a nice early bull here and uh, this is a magnificently beautiful straight part of the road and uh, i think it was when was it was it new year's eve it was New Year's Eve, uh, the great race of the Sabi Sands took place here. Uh, James, I'm um, slow Hendry, or James the tortoise Hendry, and Brent the hare Leo Smith, uh, who took in a, a live sprint uh, to see who was the fastest person at Juma. And obviously, that one, much to James's shock and horror. I really did think I was going to lose that. Oh, you are lying now, Andrew. Uh, we have reviewed the footage. <laughs> there was no false start. Yes. Uh, James was very insistent on reviewing the footage. Um, there, there's quite a strong competitive streak that runs through both, both of us. to know what happened to the Pride and Scarface. Uh, we're joking, Scarface, we could almost also nickname him Al Pacino, but I think we'll stick with Scarface. Uh, uh, they moved off to the east, uh, Matthew. So as I said, I was worried that they wouldn't be around for too much longer because where they were, the closest water was, uh, was to the east outside of our travel zone. So I know Aubrey from Gallego is, he, they can drive there and he's busy looking for those lines right now. And if they do find them, I will let you know what's happening there. But they crossed into Torchwood. Uh, the Pride crossed with Jamie on the Sunset Safari and a Scarface actually crossed it during the day. So I did promise uh, I was going to take you to an area where we could have a look at how the elephants are changing the landscape. And they're one of the few sort of what you would call keystone species uh, that are able to cha change the la landscape. And another one of the keystone species in Africa uh, for changing landscapes is the hippopotamus. Uh, and that's because they're quite often, not so much here, but in other areas they'll keep river channels clear of water weeds and, and mud and silt by constantly walking up and down. So another one of those important keystone species. There are very few species outside of human beings that are actually physically able to change the environment around them to suit themselves or have a major effect on the environment around them. And hippo uh, and elephant and buffalo are three of those very important species that are able to do that. So we're going to just check uh, the eastern edge of quarantine. Hopefully, there will be some elephant this side. Uh, and I did, I did forget to mention during the great race of 2015, um, in the process of defeating James, I popped a hamstring. 
uh, much to James's delight. I think that was the only thing he could take comfort in uh, because of his, his, his loss. And uh, it made it look a lot closer than it was. They should have won by quite a bit more if my hamstring hadn't decided to, to play up. But it, it, my hamstring is sufficiently recovered. Thank you, Donna. He was um, wondering about that, mentioning that. I did have to um, limp around a little bit. And for uh, the first few days of my leave, um, it was a little bit sore, especially since we were walking quite long distances uh, around uh, Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. But James is going to come back, and due to the fact that he uh, he lost, and uh, Sharon thinks he's probably going to come back and go on and on about my days as an underwear model. Well, my retort to James is at least I had the opportunity to be an underwear model. Most of the answers coming through incorrect. It seems like we definitely gonna have to do a bit more tracking. The closest one that's come through so far is a scrub hair. A scrub hair leaves almost identical tracks to that, except it's uh, a lot uh, bigger. And I'll give you a little clue. Um, it's smaller than a, than a hair, and it is also a rodent. try to figure out what I'm talking about. Uh, let's go jump on the back with the gorgeous Jamie, uh, who's with the most numerous antelope in Africa, south of the Sahara. And we've actually appeared to have what looks like half the population of Impala on Juba wandering across the road. I've had to stop for a roadblock of Impala wandering through, and they just look so beautiful in this morning light. And it makes a nice change after chatting about the smelly hyenas. We're looking at one of the most fastidious antelope species within this particular area. They are constantly grooming and keeping clean. Unfortunately, they've all just gone across the road into some dense vegetation. But I wanted to show you how their coats shine in the morning light. Where are you going, guys? I'm going for a drink. Amazing to see how much the little baby impala have grown. Okay, let's try this lot. There's more that way, since our lot wants to disappear. Here we go, we've got one obliging lady. You're gonna stick around, girl. You're gonna watch us from behind the bush. You'll be left behind. I know that Brent mentioned as we we're coming across here. Look at that. Oh, they're such graceful animals. I know that Brent mentioned that you're looking at the most numerous antelope species south of the Sahara. And Safari, I'm so glad you've stayed with us for the Sunrise Safari. You wanted to know if we know the population of each of the animal species. We could probably give you rough totals. Um, censuses are done, but not necessarily published within the Greater Kruger area every year. It's quite expensive to do a game count. Generally, the, for example, something like a wild dog is very carefully monitored. So we know pretty much exactly, down to the individual, exactly how many wild dog there are on here. It's a, around 194 in this particular area. With some of the other species, it's a little bit more difficult. So for example, the impala, how many would I say? 
I would guess there's about 200,000 of them in this particular park. There are lots and lots and lots of them. And what's fascinating about them is that they're, the way that they have evolved has remained unchanged for hundreds of thousands of years. And they've hit upon the perfect successful species design. And their population almost, I would say, goes up by about a third every single year to help to maintain populations even with the regularity that they fall victim to predation. So it's being the most common antelope species, it's probably one of the most common prey species as well. And about within the Kruger Park area itself, about 80% of a wild dog's diet consists of impala. Just in general populations, I mean the, the lion population is pretty easy to estimate. Within the Sabi Sands, which is a private conservancy that is... I just want to know what this hornbill's shouting at. Sorry, I've been, I've been watching it out of the corner of my eye. Let me go back a little bit. It keeps screeching. And I can't quite work out what's upsetting it. I don't know if it's having a confrontation with another hornbill species. It's making a very unusual noise. What's happening here, guys? Are you begging for food? Are you two in competition? Looks like two males. Hard to tell because they're not sitting still. Or is it begging? Doesn't look like a juvenile to me. Are you guys fighting over berries or something? They seem to be plucking something off the tree. It looks as though the tree is fruiting. Maybe it's just a, a little bit of a squabble over the best and ripest fruits. They definitely seem to be munching on... I'm trying to work out what exactly this tree is. It's been so mauled by elephants that I can't quite tell. They are feeding. <laughs> Hopping about. Look at how, this is actually fascinating to watch how agile they are in the way that they're gripping. Oops, dropped it. Quick, grab it. It's begging. It is, that bird's definitely begging. They're not in competition. Being fed by the individual on the left. That's interesting. Now this particular bird species. Sean, you've heard about or read about the relationship with dwarf mongoose and you wanted to know whether that's true. And the answer is yes, and particularly with these yellow-billed hornbills, although it does occur with red-billed hornbills. And I'm going to explain it to you in a moment. I just want to get another view of them. Uh, they're going to disappear into the thick vegetation. So yes, Sean, the hornbills do have a really interesting relationship with... Oh, we're going to hit a roadblock here. With dwarf mongoose. It's something that scientists have done a significant amount of research into. And essentially, I'm just going to take this opportunity to pop off the road here. Since this road has a couple of ditches that make life very difficult. So you'll just have to put up with me facing into the bushes in answer to the question until that other vehicle drives past. So Sean... The dwarf mongoose and the, ground, and the yellow billed hornbill tend to go out foraging together. And what that means for them is that they can, the dwarf mongoose catch the various insect species, but they're quite messy eaters. Often some get away, some are injured, or the bits of the, the insects that they're after get left behind. So the hornbills can swoop down and grab it. For the dwarf mongoose, it means, which you can imagine, if you're a dwarf mongoose, your eyes are very close to the ground never know when a predator might be lurking. There's a lot of different species out there that would love a dwarf mongoose as a snack. So having the hornbills around means that they've got an extra early warning system. But what's been so fascinating in the research that's done into this phenomenon is that certain 
hornbills. It's the same hornbills that associate with certain groups of dwarf mongoose, families of dwarf mongoose. And they've even recorded cases where the dwarf mongoose, if the hornbills are late, the dwarf mongoose show a reluctance to go out foraging. And if on a cold morning, the dwarf mongoose decide to sleep in, the hornbills have actually been seen flying up to the entrance of their burrows and crawling down into the tunnels to wake them up, to get them to go out with them. And very often I've seen it with my own eyes that you see dwarf mongoose and, and yellow billed hornbills foraging together. So they do have quite a tight association and it's entirely mutually beneficial. It's also, I mean, to be fair, that's one example where you often see that relationship, but with all of the animal species, you'll find that they'll be quite happy to, that's why you had that bird feeding party with Brent, with them all moving together. You'll find that most animal species prefer to have safety in numbers, particularly the prey species. It seems as though there are some elephants left on Juma. Let's pop over to Brent so he can show you. So we were going to show you what elephants do to the bush and fortunately we can do that with an elephant in picture. So Steph um, on YouTube said, oh, they had a special request for Ellie's much earlier this morning. So here we go, Steph. Also, these Ellie's have just crossed in. We're quite close to our southern boundary that we've already driven down today. So these Ellie's have just crossed in. So perfect timing. And a nice breeding herd. Let's get a little bit further and deeper into the breeding herd. And you can see it, nice relaxed body language. So we're going to make our way. Let's see if there's any little ones. Remember, always pop your car into low range, nice and even ribs when you're approaching Ellie's. Monkey man, just quickly before we continue on with these Ellie's, Monkey man, Molly, Mary and Lynn uh, got that little track question correct. It is a squirrel. Okay, I'm going to sneak forward a little bit. See, and also always remember when you start the car, especially when you're in close proximity. There we go. So, oh, it's going to pop out for us. Uh, to elephants. Let the car run for a few seconds so they get used to the noise before you start moving. It's another way to make sure you don't uh, upset the animals. And there we go, there's a little fork-tailed dronga taking advantage um, of any insects disturbed by the ellies. So now I'm going to move a little bit forward. Like you're, in, you're up to mischief. Very much mischievous face there. And oh, elephant argument behind us somewhere. It sounded like someone being chastised. Oh, there we go. She's tail up, trumpeting. I just got a glimpse of her through the bush. I wonder what gave her a fight. It could be that she's having an argument with another elephant. Um, she could have seen a predator, unlikely though. Let's see why she's so upset. Could be one of those teenage boys. 
causing havoc. And here she comes. She is very upset. I'm going to stop the car. And um, this is a bit of misplaced aggression coming at us. It's okay. Uh-uh. Stop it. It's okay. So something upset her that wasn't us. It was quite far away from us, but she's come charging. Nonsense. Enough nonsense now. There we go. So again, very important in reading elephant behavior. If we had to drive or move and make a lot of noise now, she, look at that. She's just showing us how strong she is. Um, she would probably chase us, but if we keep still uh, and not move, you can see she's moving away. That was a very, very, very good example of um, displacement anger being caused by something else. That's why when there are big must balls and that around, this behavior can be quite common. You have to be more careful with the breeding herd. And so the rest of the herd behind her is still completely ignoring her temper tantrums. She has a youngish female. So a prime candidate for harassment by big bulls. Look at that. She just flattened and flattened that tree. And you can see now her tail's still slightly erect. And she is still a little bit uncomfortable. You can see her tail's going down now. She's relaxing. So that 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 was very important for those of you who drive around um, in Kruger. And now you can see her tail's flapping if we come out a bit nicely. Uh, she's changed. She's not upset anymore. Um, that little bit of behavior we saw there was we just happened to be around when she was angry. She could have done that to another elephant. And the way she pushed that tree, she made sure um, there were two bushes and another tree in between us. So she felt safe because there was stuff between us and her, but she still wanted to remind us how strong and powerful she can be. So we've got a, uh, a comment from a, a new <laughs> sailor who's, uh, this is their first drive, and says, are you crazy, Brent? Well, yes, I saw that, Andrew. I <laughs> uh, see how you try to get it in without me spotting. Uh, I am slightly crazy, but not when it comes to animals. Um, I have a huge respect for these animals. And fortunately, I've grown up in areas with them. I've, and the first time, uh, one of my first memories is actually walking up to elephants. and. Uh, knowing what to do and how to read their behavior is how you stay safe out here. So if we try to move away fast, she would have got more worked up, the noise of the engine revving and that, and that would have caused us to chase, uh, caused her to chase us. She's now completely calm and feeding. So that's good. I'm going to move forward slightly so you can see her, and you can see how her body language has completely changed. And that is a really important thing, guys, if you are driving yourself around uh, in an area where there's elephants, watch their tails. Uh, when the tails are erect, they are upset. So you might not see some of the other signs, but it's a very nice, big, visible sign. There she is. Doesn't look like. And if we look at her now, it's hard to believe she was charging at us and knocking down trees. Uh, not even 30, or not even two minutes ago. And let's go have a look what actually could have caused that behavior. So it happened over there. Let's go see. There might be one of those big bulls or maybe some of those uh, teenage bulls that can get a little bit rough and tumble. Uh, and that's quite often when that, the, the, the young eddies get to the age of um, sort of between 12 and 15, especially the, the boys, um, that the, the females will push them out of the, out of the breeding herd because of that rumbunctious behavior. Uh, same to Sailor, the new viewer, if you want to see some really crazy elephant stuff, um, there's a video of myself with elephants chasing wild dogs. So if you enjoyed that little little elephant insert we just had, maybe you should go have a look at that. those Ellie's chasing the wild dogs with me uh, a couple of months ago. So I can't see any big bulls. Little bulls. 
boy here. Two little boys. One little boy, and maybe she just got a fight. It's, it's very difficult. I can't see anything that could have caused that. Um, maybe she could have possibly even seen a snake. Who knows? And there we go. And this little boy right in the thick of the buffalo thorn, munching away. <laughs> they are incredible animals. specific names for certain elephants um, or, or certain herds of elephants. Uh, well, Austin, we see a lot of elephants and the problem with elephants is they move around so much uh, that they can be here for quite a while and then we won't see them for two or three months. So it, it makes it a little bit difficult for us to keep constant IDs on them. But there are distinguishing features like we can see this little boy here is missing his left tusk. They probably broke it either playing um, or, or using it to break down trees or whatnot. So he's only got one tusk, so that, for example, would be quite a nice distinguishing feature for him. Also, you look for tears in the ears uh, and very, very rarely, very distinct skin patterns. So there was one young little elephant bull, and he must be about a year and a half old to two years now, uh, that we nicknamed Mr. Wrinkly Bottom, and he had a very distinct sort of a skin pattern. But that is, that is unusual. And... Um, Unless you're following the same elephants on a daily basis, it does become a little bit difficult to discern them, and they do move in and out, and we get different herds constantly. young bull elephants that have been pushed out of uh, the breeding herds form bachelor groups. Uh, they do, uh, Michael, and also quite often, especially when they've just been pushed out and they're still a little bit nervous, um, they will trail uh, the, the breeding herd. So quite often when you find a couple of young bulls that sort of seems to be by themselves on the edge, if you carry on a little bit further, uh, you'll find a group of females and, uh, and youngsters. Let's go have a quick look here. Ah, so as impressive as it was, she chose a very good tree to flatten. And um, if we have a look on the inside, the termites have eaten it. So it, it was a bit easier to push down than it would have been if it was completely healthy. But still, I don't think I would have been able to do that with my forehead. Maybe Andrew, he might be able to. Okay, the rest of you are going to move out into the road over there. So. Let's go ahead and join them. stand by here and wait for these ellies to move out in front of us. Uh, Jamie's got a very interesting bird to show you. One of the most striking bird species, or at least a shrike species. Oh dear. Birds, man. <laughs> Hold on, I can still see it. 
live wildlife filming. You just never know when that bird's going to disappear off. Here we go. Luckily, it hasn't gone too far away, so we can still have a look at it with its long tail. This is a long-tailed shrike, or well, that's the old name at least. It's now called a magpie shrike. And it really is a very attractive looking bird. Interestingly enough, one of the few species where both the male and the female have long, long tails, which is something I've always questioned as to why. Because obviously with long tails, that's usually a male's approach to breeding plumage to impress the ladies. I'm not sure what it is. And usually it's a disadvantage because those heavy tail feathers actually slow the bird down and make it harder to fly. So why it is that both male and female magpie shrikes have long tails, nobody's ever been able to properly answer my question. But with this awesome camera, we can actually have a look at the feathers around its face and around its beak. And what birds have, similar to the whiskers of cats, yeah, have a look there. Thank you, Tibbs. You can see all around the fluffiness. Now those are known as rictal bristles. And it's similar to the effective whiskers. Bye-bye. Off he goes. <laughs> this time, gone for good. But yes, the rict rictal bristles around the face have sensory nerves attached to them as a way of helping the bird both navigate and also know exactly when to close their beak around a prey species, so something like an instinct. Instinct? Insect. My goodness. Well, anyway, I just wanted to show you that quickly. Brent is still with his elephants, so let's pop back over there. She's so Ellie's are slowly moving, and she's just turned her bottom to us. So, <laughs> sneak forward a skosh. two years old you can see the little tusks protruding so they're born with milk tusks that so they lose at about a year old and then their main set of tusks start coming through and before we were rudely interrupted by that slightly upset female uh, there was a question I can't remember exactly what it was from about do Asian elephants have bigger tusks than African uh, as far as I know, not. The largest ever recorded tusk is from an African elephant, who, and it was from Tanzania, said to have been shot on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro um, by a local slave trader by the name of Tipo Tip, and uh, those weighed around 200 and Diana, there we go. Diana wanted to know about elephant tusks. And as far as I know, these are the largest tusks ever recorded uh, out of all elephant species. And uh, it, as I said, shot by Tipo Tip on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, and they weighed around 240 pounds apiece. So, incredible that. And uh, they've had quite an interesting life since then. And they've moved around a bit. So they were taken by Tipo Tip uh, to the Sultan of Zanzibar. Uh, so they were taken and given to the Sultan of Zanzibar. Uh, the Sultan of Zanzibar then gifted them to the British consulate on Zanzibar, where they hung on his veranda for many years uh, before eventually being then donated to the British Museum of Natural History. And if you are ever in London, you can actually go visit those tusks. And they are incredible, Long, they're longer than I am tall, much longer than I am tall. And uh, obviously they weigh quite a bit more than me as well. It said it took three slaves to carry each tusk. So here we go. Tipo Tip, Sultan of Zanzibar, the British consulate. Lots of fantastic little stories uh, from the history of Africa.
trying to see where the best view is. Uh, this would like to know, are there ever casualties with the young bulls when they're first pushed out? And this, uh, not, not really, very seldom. Uh, and this, uh, you're an elephant who lives in northern Botswana, specifically around the Pondo Lenyant Sabuti area, uh, where you have lions that have specialized in hunting those young bulls as they first get pushed out. But in most places, not normally. Uh, and look what we have here. Look who's coming to uh, join us at the elephants. It looks like Jamie coming down the road, uh, Jamie and Tebbs. Oh, now they've, they've, they're trying to, trying to sneak, but we've spotted them. You know, they can't hide from us. And if I can spot a leopard track, I surely can spot my girlfriend coming down the road, one would hope. Hello. Hello. It's still, and you can see uh, Jamie has forgotten to turn her lights off because they're, they're shining brightly in the daylight. There we, embarrassing. There we go. That's very unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> good thing you came, good thing I came around. I never yes, know. Yeah, you could, killed the battery. And there you can see Tebs trying to concentrate intently, like most cameramen. They tend to try avoid being on camera and try hide behind their cameras as much as possible. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Staring down the viewfinder. Uh, well, we're going to carry on and go back into where the Ellie's are. Uh, maybe you might get a bit of view to some on the other side of the road as well. Of course, we're going to the last moment. Cheers, enjoy. There we go. Uh, a randomer bumping into. And here we go. Here come the Ellie's. Just to finish off with Lissa's question about the casualty um, with young bulls, so it's very unusual uh, most of the time. Once they get beyond that sort of 10 year old, uh, it's very seldom that they are, they become casualties. And as we know, elephants are very long lived, they can live to about 65 years. And they're just slowly feeding through the bush here. And what you quite often find is that uh, when elephants are not on a mission, so heading to a specific area, uh, they will spread out. And the herd can be spread out over quite a few, quite a vast distance, a couple of hundred meters uh, while they feed. So it's been a beautiful morning out here in the bush, even though, even though there hasn't, hasn't been that much cat activity. Well, there has, but the tracks have unfortunately led away from us. Uh, but that's the, one of the things about being in the bush, they could quite easily come back during the day or, or tomorrow and uh, keeps us excited. We love being able to track uh, the big cats and I'm just happy there's lots of Ellie's back. So it's been wonderful. Don't forget to join us on the Sunset Safari. Also, uh, a big happy birthday to our commander in chief, Mr. Graham Wellington. Uh, I'm not gonna say how old he's turning. Might be a bit embarrassing, but a uh, happy, happy birthday to Graham. I uh, hope uh, Em and the kids have a great day with you guys. So I think we're gonna go see Jamie for the last little bit of drive. Uh, so, bye, and we'll see you on the Sunset Safari. And surprise, surprise, Tebs and myself have also encountered a couple of the stragglers of the elephant herd that Brent is being with. I didn't realize that he was coming down this road, otherwise I would have chosen a different route, but I guess I could say, I just couldn't go another five minutes without saying hello to him. But a really wonderful morning, and I just want to 
join Brent as well in wishing Graham a huge happy birthday from all of the Wild Earth staff, of course. You guys all know that without Graham, none of this would be possible. So a big happy birthday, Graham. I hope you're having a wonderful day out and about celebrating. We're all sending you lots and lots of love. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a beautiful and somewhat peaceful morning after the incredible excitement of yesterday. Really stunning sky. It's a beautiful day that's going to come through ahead. And I've absolutely enjoyed being out with all of you. So thank you all. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to have you on the back of our vehicle. And thank you for your questions and your comments. It has been great. A big thank you to Tebs for his fantastic camera work and his cameo appearance, of course, as well as to the lovely ladies in FC. So join Brent and I think myself. No, sorry, Scott and myself will be on this afternoon. So join us for the Sunset Safari. Cheers for now.